Hello folks! Hello! Welcome back to Wandering Into Wellness. Uh, Finn and Lydia, your huge, and in between us, the beautifully red cardigan dressed, uh, Dr. Fiona McLoon. And I know I throw a doctor out there with some heavy weight, um, but the reason that we have Fiona on is because we have spent, I think, the last four years scrabbling around in the dirt, and probably I've spent the last 15 years scrabbling around in the dirt, to try and get to know what is the tangible line between what we're doing now and what we're like curious about in terms of health and healing and what people were doing and why it's kind of meaningful for us to have come to this point just because I think it's important to have like a thread right mm -hmm. so that we can actually start to tease something back into like at the dawns of time people obviously did things to keep themselves healthy and we're still kind of doing the same sort of thing mm -hmm. right a little bit yeah does that make sense yeah so like for, can you give me an idea, like when you, you, so you started, you have a PhD in traditional medicinal knowledge, and can you give me an idea of like when you started into that research, did you have an obvious track towards those traditions, or was it kind of like, did you have to kind of like scrabble around looking for like, well, are these things new, are these things old, was there a lot of like obvious kind of routes to go down in terms of like which herbs were used and when and by who and that sort of thing? So what I looked at was, um, something called the school's manuscript collection and it's uh, in the National Folklore Collection in Dublin. So in the 1930s it was a nationwide scheme across 26 counties of the new free state. It was very much to do with the uh, political time at that moment. Okay. Ireland was just had gained independence oh. and we were trying to document folklore and kind of Reclaim our Irishness. Reclaim our okay. Irishness. Exactly okay. that. Huh. And um, there was a, and it was, it was kind of linked as well to the Gaelic League. Had kind of set this off as well. And um, what they did was, it was very forward thinking. Is they got school children across the country from the ages of eleven to thirteen, I think it was, um, to collect information on a whole range of folkloric topics. Weird. They trusted the kids to do they it. They got the kids to do That's it. So cool. what they did is they got the kids to go home to their parents and their grandparents and neighbours, and it was a real kind of so the tradition in Ireland, uh, you know, would be the oral tradition and mm. telling stories. So it kind of fed into that. So they went to people's houses, and then they wrote them down in their copy books and they brought them to the school teacher no. and it was just this really gorgeous thing that they did and one of the topics so the teachers were a huge part of it because mm. they were instrumental in kind of running the scheme in all mm -hmm. these schools and um, they picked the topics for the children to collect information on so they were given a booklet originally and there was 55 different topics so like a whole like they collected stuff on like games they played, just stories, mm. you know, um, local areas, just everything to do with folklore, everything to do with life at Amazing. that time. So one of the topics then was on traditional cures or disease healing and herbs. Okay. So this, all this was written down by the kids and then they brought it into the teacher and then the teacher said it to, sent it to, um, they got the kid with the best handwriting to tr transcribe it into this manuscript. Yeah. One child per class. Yeah, Aww. yeah. Oh my God, and so cute. then it was lovely. And then they sent all the information back to um, the National Folklore, the Irish Folklore Commission at the okay. time. Yeah, and it yeah. was then compiled into these manuscripts. Wow. And so that's, that's what I exam looked at that information okay and so the people who would have been transcribing that wouldn't have been medically trained or have medicine as part no. of it. so does that mean that the stuff that you're dealing with as people like they didn't know the things they were referring to or was it the case that the people who are alive at that stage would have had like good knowledge of working knowledge of what they were transcribing like would it have made sense to them or were they like were they writing down things that were like i don't know what elder what 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 it it would have so they would have had like no botanic knowledge so yeah. on the plants that were written so there was it's very much like uh, the, you assumed when they say a plant mm. you can only assume because there was no there and there was no specimens of, or anything yeah. you know so there's a lot of that but it was also because the kids were young it was all very child friendly so there's a lot of things so in the cures like there's no cures really to do with like gynecological issues. I was going to say sexual like health that. probably yeah, got left out. No, totally left out. And even like even um, you know there's nothing about midwifery or anything like that. So there's kind of holes in it, and it's all just things that would have been deemed kind of suitable for kids. Okay. And so when you started looking into that, mm -hmm. did you have a really clear picture of like which rabbit hole you're going to go down, or like because it must have been just like I mean that's just a raft of. It's such a broad manuscript, it's, right? Uh, it's, yeah. yeah, a huge amount of information. And I went into it interested in the plants because my background mm. is being a herbalist. So I was mostly inter interested in the plants. But then, like, there's so much good stuff on ritual practices. Yeah. Mm. And, like, 
you know, and then, well, they're kind of religious as well. They kind of go hand in hand. And even just like products, household products were used a lot of the time, you know, like baking soda. And, yeah. That was know, all in there, was it? Yeah, all of it. So, the 101 uses for baking soda stuff was actually the, something that it, really goes back a bit. I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, and there was a, something called blue. So it was like a washing detergent that was blue that would have been common at that time used. So that was like for like any skill ailment or like it a sting or something, terrifying. they'd say put blue on it. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, <laughs> and was sulfur blue. came up, but like chemicals and, oh, you know, wow. so it was a total combination. So that's what kind of came up. So I went in just interested in plants and thinking I'd find something super cool. But it was like all of it, like the broader picture was kind of cooler. Yeah. Of the range of things. Yeah. And so did it give you a sense then of like, of Irish humans and humanity and that thread that I was talking about at the start, of like our approach to cure and like something about Irishness and Irish herbal healing like mm -hmm. did, did it set us out do you did you start to discover I'm not trying to put words in your mouth but did yeah. you start to discover anything around like do Irish it, does the Irish culture necessarily have some sort of like real healing potential as you feel like you hear reference like you feel like you hear that like the land of saints and scholars stuff yeah. and there's like like Latin positions and you feel like you hear there's like a strong attachment to the druidic stuff and all yeah. that sort of kind of Celtic old school healing things. Yeah. It, it, could you did that did that start to come out? Did that start to emerge? It, it came out very much so in the likes of uh, holy wells and holy water and all that. You know, like that would be a huge was a huge portion of it. Yeah. And that kind of very much feeds into that, like the land. Yeah. You know, and sacred places and sacred stones and things like that would have come up a bit okay. as well. Yeah. But it was very much like it is interesting when you look at the plants that were used <clears throat> they're common plants that are found it's and that's what ha tends to happen in cultures obviously mm. it's the kind of they use what you have mm. and then it's used out of necessity mm. because they didn't have access to you know and, and maybe it was it's better in ways that they had to learn this than you know like access kind of then is how to things is how people lose the knowledge yeah 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 yeah, yeah. You know? of course of so course it, it, as we've kind of done yeah 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 totally so it was um yeah, what was your question? I don't know, but, it was, but it, it, what I was asking was like, how yeah. did, did that, did you start to kind of see some sort, did you get a sense of, I don't know, like gravitas around Irish healing and uh, like a sense of, I don't know, that, that maybe Irish people have within them some sort of healing potential that Irish, like you were saying, places yeah. did, you're saying holy yeah. wells and that sort of stuff. And so do people. So there is a huge thread of people having specific cures and families mm. having cures. Mm. So oftentimes it would be um, a father would leave the cure to the daughter and then that daughter would leave it to her son and it kind of went down in families like that and mm. these cures would be secret recipes. So I got none of the secret recipes but I might get, you you, you might see written that like, you know, Mary had the cure for something and there was a recipe but it would never be told. It would be kept within a family. Um, and why the secretness? Or is it, what was that about? I don't know. So there's it, it goes along with the the maybe like the sacredness of having a cure. Okay. And it's a responsibility. So the other thing is there was no monetary fee. So if someone mm -hmm. had this cure in their family, they would you wouldn't charge for it. And I spoke with the man in um, his family was referenced in the in the collection and um, he but he was still practicing um, in Wexford. I think it was he's a farmer and he had the cure for skin cancer. And Whoa. he told me that he got the cure from his uncle <clears throat> and his uncle just told him what plants to pick and whatever else. And um, then you dry them, grind them up. And then he taught him how to recognize what skin cancer he could treat. Whoa. So he couldn't treat everything, but he would know just by look what he could treat and what he couldn't. And then you put this paste on and um, then a plaster and it would fall off and then you would do it again. Mm. I think it, you, you might do it twice. And then I said to him, I was like, and um, I was like, and what's the, because I was like deep in the school of pharmacy, I was like, you know, what's the efficacy? Like, yeah. do you know what's, your what's your rate? What's your rate of cure? What's your, what's your rate? And he was like, well, like, he said, you know, I wouldn't treat anyone it wouldn't work on, you know, and he said he had people coming with other sorts of cancers begging him for, you know, and he said, like, I can't, I can literally just do this. But, um, and then I was like, and how many people would you see a year? And he, he said, oh, and then I said, well, you know, how many people would you see a month? And he said, people come every day. And then his plan was to pass the cure mm -hmm. on to his son. And I think he had a daughter as well. But he was holding off as long as possible because he felt it was such a responsibility. Wow. And he didn't charge for it. And you, you have this, like, 
like that you have this kind of gift Whoa. and you, you, it's your kind of duty to but that it's so sad because he was that is like a, that there's a that that type of cure and the skin cancer cure is is documented all over Ireland hmm. but he was saying there was another family who were doing it and the guy actually emigrated and so his family was the last family doing it so that's kind of what tends Whoa. to happen is it dies out and a lot of the time it's people leaving Ireland mm. and um and the, it just yeah it's, Go on, sorry. It, yeah it's an and it's an interesting thing to look into isn't it because if you think about like the tradition of Irish people emigrating mm. and how there's a sense now I feel like in Ireland of people trying to reclaim that Irishness mm -hmm. and you know all these people writing books on Irish words and Irish traditions and trying to get back to like being really proud of being mm -hmm. Irish and what is the essence of being Irish but then at the same time there's been this massive emigration going on where the Irishness has just got diluted mm. so far because there's been yeah. this massive emigration that there's kind of this kernel of like well what what is it what to is be it? Irish and, and projects like this that you're talking about it's so exciting when you're hearing about them because you're going when you read this, when you study into this, maybe there's an illumination then of what mm. is what sets aside. It's almost like what you were asking is what sets aside Irish traditional healing remedies versus mm. English, yeah. you know, or our neighbouring countries. Mm -hmm. What what's the kernel of Irishness? Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 totally. And you you wonder what populations must have had to do. Like imagine Irish people, somebody with the cure moves to mm -hmm. America or mm -hmm. Australia, one of those awful immigrations, and they arrive with totally foreign herbs, mm. like, to yeah, like, exactly. like a language they just can't speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there must have been some very interesting like interweavings of like Aboriginal traditions mm -hmm. and Irish traditions, because I'm sure a lot of those folk cures in some way must have persisted, but it sort of makes sense if you don't have a Materia Medica, mm -hmm. we don't have like a, a written down thing, how of course those things disappear, yeah. how important it is to, to retrieve them and reclaim them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and it is interesting because in cultures all over the world, like the same things were done before like before radio, before television, before any kind of like massive communication, the same traditional healing practices, like things like transference goes global. So that's when you would give a condition to something, an object or an mm -hmm. animal or something. So like a classic Irish example would be for warts and it would be a bag of stones and you'd rub the stone on the wart or you'd okay. rub a potato. Okay. And you'd bury the potato. So essentially, and the potato, as the potato rotted, your wart would rot. Or if it was a stone, you'd put the bag of stones on the road, and then it was thought if someone picked up the stones, they the would get the would, warts. Oh. They, they would, yeah. So it's like this church. It's, so it's not yet. But that, so that Don't was a huge potato. practice in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And it would, it covered like, it's, 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 it covers so many different types of cures. So like another one would be um, the. So a snail on a bush would be another one. You'd rub a snail in a wart. I'm only thinking of wart cures now. <laughs> they were very prominent yeah. among the really? kids. And my yeah. my okay. you know, yeah, my mum did um, when we lived in Nepal for a while. And we lived like miles up in the Himalayas. So we had no doctors or anything. Yeah. My brother at one stage got warts really badly. He had a massive wart on the palm of his hand. And my mum had tried all these things. And then she was speaking to her brother in Ireland. Yeah. And because my mum's Irish. Okay. Um, and he said that he knew a seventh son of a seventh son that they had used for their, when my mum was little and all their brothers and sisters was when they got warts they used this family because there was a seventh son of a seventh yeah. son and they did a thing I can't remember exactly what it was but it, now that when you're saying it I think there was something to do with rubbing a thing on the wart and then the wart you hid it somewhere and then on the seventh day the wart was going to fall off the thingy yeah. and you have to just believe it and also again there was no payment and there was all this but you had to believe it and, the, and sure enough it did. Off it fell. Yeah. Wow. And and they, and they were, I think it was something about being in the bath, and he was there in the bath, and just all of them, gone. they just literally peeled off. Oh, weird. Wow. One day, peeled off the skin. And my uncle would still, my uncle would be very traditional and wouldn't be into kind of alternative things yeah. so much, but he still would use seventh sons of seventh sons and go to these traditional healers that had been in the family, and when there's something wrong with the horses, he'd be a farmer. Yeah. They would go to the healers yeah. before they would, would go to the medics. Still. Mm. It's yeah. it's really interesting because there's something there's something that we really connect to about the trust of that. They, before the brain kicks in and we start doing the doubt thing, yeah. we start going, well, hang on, how does that actually work? Yeah. And, and what's, what's the rate of cure? The the yeah. 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 I was like, what should I be asking? What's yeah. the important thing? Yeah. But we've seen it when it's when there has that yeah. oral tradition where you remember your mother did that thing and then your father did that yeah. thing and the grandparents did that thing. It's so deeply rooted in us because I think that there's this knowledge that it's of us. Mm -hmm. It's of our land, mm -hmm. it's of our ancestors. And so there isn't a questioning, it's just, sure, we've seen it work a million times. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you rub the thing and you do the thing and off it falls. And of course. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting. So what I've noticed having like been studying this for years is 
everyone I encounter who I end up talking about this to, if I if the, like if I if I do, I don't talk to everyone about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you let's go you bring your PhD everywhere you yeah, go. No, no, I definitely don't. But um, everyone has a story. Yeah. Everyone, and like what you're saying, it's the traditional. It's not. It's not seen as like um, airy fairy yeah. stuff or sometimes you know like the, even the herbs people think like oh that's a bit crazy yeah. you know like mm -hmm. you know I go to a doctor but there is something deeper there's something mm -hmm. different about the Irish healer completely yeah. and everyone has a story there's like you know uh, they've not met one person that doesn't have a positive story of like um, going to um, going to even a healer my mum when she was pregnant with my brother she had a horrible rash all over her body and she went to a guy who down in Wexford as well I think or Wicklow and he did a prayer over her and then gave her this little cross and then she had to go back in seven days and then sure enough she said it was the when, when she got home that night she said it was it was just gone it was the first night she got, had sleep it was like that and there's all these this because there's different and the seventh son of the seventh son is another huge one in Ireland okay like, is it yeah I've never heard that before really? interesting no literally never heard seventh son of the seventh what? son I mean it makes sense but I've well, never yeah so never heard it, it yes yeah, it's not weird uh he usually has the, and it can be the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, so it's with no, no kids in between. It has to be all boys, oh, okay. and they all girls. But it's a very okay. like um, Irish healer. Um, like there's common, always seemed yeah. to be a gift in the seventh is, yeah. thing, as yeah. long as they're all wow. Uh, yeah, and it tends to be for ringworm or not? Mm. Is it ringworm? I think it is ringworm. Yeah, which is the fungal thing. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, but they can sometimes do all sorts of healing. And what they do is when a baby is born, or what they did is. And the problem now, though, is that no one's having sex. That's kids. exactly what it is. Like, 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 yeah, so it's, it's so, so Irish rare. that there are even enough people who have sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for it to know, be a so thing. There's no people, and what they do, so if the seventh son was born, they would put a worm in his hand, and then if the worm died, it meant he had the cure. Oh. And he was this little child that grew up then to have this ability to cure people, so people would come from everywhere and get cured by the seventh son. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. And interestingly, in like other cultures, so like in, I think it's in Argentina, the seventh son is believed to be, obviously the, the seventh son with no girls in between is believed to be a werewolf. And Transylvania is believed to be, what is it, um, a vampire or something like that. Yeah, so it's, it has different, it has kind of opposite concept, like kind of in different wow. cultures. And, and and is that something so when, and transference also has that dark and light kind of yeah. thing as well to it doesn't it yeah it does actually and did you find so like i mean essentially what we're talking about is witchcraft yeah <laughs> like basically yeah. what, what it could i mean it's the, the term that would be globally yeah. ascribed to it in a pejorative way right yeah um so did you did, would you say that you recognize the types of healings you were engaged in as like as a form of witchcraft like is there is there are there any of the sorts of go on no go yeah, on yeah no 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 it's going on so yeah. are, are there the cures that that you that you discovered are there things where like pharmacy and pharmacology and pharmacology caught up with that or are these things just kind of lost to that kind of liminal space where we we're never supposed to be able to fully understand it like I mean, certainly seven son of seven son. I mean, there's there's no max yeah. in that. Unfortunately, we're gonna have well, not unfortunately, fortunately maybe, but it's relying on a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think? You know, like where do, where does herbalism end and witchcraft begin? Where's like where is that line for you? It's well, like that. It's so like you can't quantify the seven son and what he does mm. or the, these things. They, they 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 can't be looked at in the same way. So it's it's often in a lot of like ethno medical research. It's just a lot like it, it's that aspect because that aspect can't be quantified that kind mm -hmm. of ritual practice so you say magic and i never thought of it as magic even though like that's the perfect word to describe it but, or did you say witchcraft i said witchcraft, actually, witchcraft, actually, witchcraft, actually, that's witchcraft. Cool. i was like did i say magic I yeah, know, sorry. Okay, but so basically yeah but it, it is, is the same idea isn't it yeah it, it totally is but and if you kind of break it down though it's like it's a, just a ritual that people are doing and it's kind of faith-based mm. yeah faith-based okay. mm. so it like it um, but but that's all if that all kind of blends into one like how do you distinguish mm. one from the other I don't know but it's in terms of like where herbs begin and um, and like you know what that space is it's that like it's it's impossible to study mm. like that in the same way that you can kind of you know pharmacologically study a plant yeah you know and so a lot of that has been lost so like in most ethnobotanical studies 
like that's just kind of ignored and then we focus on a plant and then we focus on mm. a compound mm. within that plant we don't even look at the whole plant hardly yeah you know we're just interested yeah. we just break it down break it down and we're we're so so much is lost mm. do you know yeah. and the what i find really interesting at the moment is we're in it we're in a time where um the sorts of like evidence-based medicine has reached a like a level of like i don't know acceptance that is kind of indefatigable even when you know things come out about medicines being produced and, and, and actually I've heard a really interesting quote recently where it's like medicine is like a blend of politics and science and blah, 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 because it's not like just pure yeah. fact like yeah. it's driven by marketing it's driven by all yeah. these sorts of like economic factors but it's like it's really interesting that at the moment we seem to be living in this moment where yeah so so medicine as as we understand you know farm pharmaceutical medicine has reached this kind of like level of like indefatigable fact and at the same time religious practices are like throughout the world also on a bit of a high right so like you know islam judaism christianity like nobody's nobody's looking at those as though like you can't go believe in little green men but when it comes to this sort of stuff when it's like whether it's like a faith-based practice or like a cure that involves i don't know like taking a bag of stones rubbing on a wart for some reason that's been dislocated and we've we've, we've got decided that we, we poo-poo that one but we mm. don't poo-poo the religious belief isn't that weird yeah yeah do you mean it like well, it's kind it, of like a like faith in god is cool but faith in like healing it's isn't 100, cool. yeah. 100 percent trust in medicine yeah. even when we're being shown like they say one thing and three months later they go oh no actually we were wrong about that thing yeah. but now it's this it's, and exactly. people go oh well then this one's definitely true even though we know that you were wrong about it three months ago but yeah. this one won't be wrong mm. until three months later we find out and then we trust again whereas in a kind of a, anything to do with ritual or witchcraft or mm. herbalism we're going well where are the studies you haven't showed us mm. any of the studies and if you don't have the studies even though we've seen with our eyes that it's worked 20 times in front mm. of us we like still don't even trust that though yeah. Yeah. and it's it's a fascinating thing isn't it because why has it got to the point that we're going we value more the studies that have been done recently and myopically where mm -hmm. we cleave apart half of mm -hmm. the stuff around it and just focus on one area but it's been done in a lab mm -hmm. and it's been done double blind placebo mm -hmm. tested and we go okay well that's the right thing whereas mm -hmm. then we've got these traditions that are maybe all traditions that mm -hmm. go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and have been tested on humans and only last mm -hmm. because the humans didn't die mm -hmm. when yeah. those things mm -hmm. happened so that's our evidence right the evidence is mm -hmm. people kept doing them and mm -hmm. they're not going to keep doing them if people were dropping yeah. off left right and center but we're like yeah but we can't see the physical proof yeah. from the manuscript that yeah. was yeah. produced in that lab by these people who just trained like yeah. 20 years ago it's a weird like why have we got that distrust mm -hmm. i think we've been people have been so disconnected from themselves like we're so like you know so back then there was no outside well there would have been in different ways but like the influence of like mm -hmm. the media and mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. is just you know and we're kind of we're so disconnected even from nature and from the rhythms of life so mm -hmm. like all these cures would have come about you know the the, the rhythms of mm -hmm. life and you know and even taking certain things at certain times of year like we're just now every you know it's false light now and mm. you know we're, we're not living with in just in, with that rhythm yeah and that's what i think mm -hmm. and then you know we, we don't know ourselves so we don't know at the mercy of external yeah. validation yeah. and other yeah. people's Blown about yeah. by metrics the twins rather yeah. than going, well it's worked for me so yeah. Yeah. Then it is, I don't need to see if yeah. you think it's right I know yeah. it right so yeah. then that's it yeah and I think we've lost like as we've lost a trust in ourselves hmm. in our own hmm. intuition a lot of people like so there's a lot of people who haven't but like on, on the whole you know yeah and then people are so suspicious of like they're so suspicious of anything like that that isn't the scientific mm. you know so yeah so tell us as well you you uh, you were saying that the reason that the the book that was being written what, what was the book called in the 1920s where the kids were going around doing the, the gathering schools evidence? manuscript collection the schools manuscript yeah. collection so you you were saying that that had come about because with there was a a, 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 a a want whatever to reclaim identity and reclaim irish mm -hmm. whatever traditions can you speak a little bit about why they went away and that idea you're saying the family physician which i'd never heard before which is really interesting so because ireland had been under control for like hundreds of years mm. so we were we kind of had gradually lost kind of the irishness the language we lost the language and um in it was in the 17th century so prior to the 17th century we had our own uh, the, the kings and like the wealthy people in the country would have had their own physician mm. who would have lived with them 
or you know lived on their land and would have paid it was like considered one of the highest roles like the highest jobs and they were called the Liege and they would they kind of belonged to this family and they would have had their own like medical texts and they had their own these families had medical schools as well and or sorry so there was family there was medical schools but then there were the rich families that had the Liege okay and it was it was a whole system and then in the 17th century they anyone with money anyone with like education mm. and they all left and mm. there's no there's no documentation there's none of the books are there there's like it's just this big hole in like it's literally this none of it's knowledge there. no and there was lots of books it wasn't an oral like, tradition this wasn't written was, down there. yeah because they had Amazing. schools mm. and and then they, that's just vanished so i don't know so it's it, in looking into it it's there's just not that much information yeah you know it's um and then well the problem is as well that it was just an oral tradition mm. in so the family like certain the eggs they would have had their own books mm. is what's it's what's been said but i mean in, in ways like who knows what's true what's not true yeah. do you know what i mean sometimes yeah. looking at history now you're like really i, I don't know. know i don't know i'm just i'm just repeating somebody is telling you a story i don't know this to story. be fact yeah, yeah i don't but it um but it very much so yeah with so with all the rich and the educated left ireland mm. So we kind of lost a lot. Mm. Um, there are some texts that haven't been transcribed from Latin, which potentially is information in them. So there, like, there, there is potentially some things that could be found, but like, there's just there's not a lot of there's not mm. a lot of information. I was reading something recently about uh, one of these old kind of medical texts. It's called like Balds something. I can't remember. And it was it was uh, part of a I was part of a podcast, but then I went like reading into it, and it was like this guy who was a physician from the 15th 16th century and had a lot of these kind of types of cures written down and one of the cures was for the plague yeah and so the uh, a researcher a kind of an ethno <coughs> medical researcher went and tried to recreate some of the recipes and they're reading it from like a combination of latin and old english as yeah. well so it's this like and then put the <coughs> thy in yeah. the, whatever it's just it's so funny i can't remember any of the the quotes but essentially it was this mixture where they they put um they took red wine and they boiled it for three days and they boiled garlic and onion and they put in like it had to be done in a certain type of <coughs> copper pot so the people who were recreating it used like copper pipe that was like the same type of copper or, or the same type of based on the same type of tin or something that would have been used at the time and um, and they took it and they tried they studied they <coughs> tested it against uh, MRSA and they did it the first time just to see just out of interest because it's like yeah. the thing we can't kill at the moment and mm -hmm. who knows and uh well we know lots of things they can but but you know whatever pharmaceutical medicine can't um but uh so they, they tested first and they the first time they tried they, they expected to see when they put a tiny bit onto this petri dish or whatever that there would be you know maybe a dot or whatever might have removed or they were just interested to see anyway came back the next morning it was like there's just gone. no sign of it it was gone that's bull's leash book but yes yeah. you know it's great <laughs> bull's, yeah. bull's leech book, book yeah. that's it yeah. oh do you know that thing that story the, i do I oh that's do. amazing I read about that oh that's amazing yeah, yeah it's fascinating but like for me that was like a great illustration of how when we've kind of come so far past a, a system of medicine which has this like you know this weight of history behind it and you know like even the fact that that's known and that it's not used Jeez. is ridiculous yeah. like it's ridiculous like it's like no the antibiotic won't work I'm like okay and yeah. then there's a balls leech book which does and yeah. i know it sounds woo woo but it's not woo woo it works and also isn't it interesting though isn't it a part of it because i'm thinking about a uh, part of my area of knowledge would be around midwifery and birth stuff and practices historically and what you see happening with that was that when there was midwives and they were in the community and mm -hmm. they had the knowledge that had been passed down for generations and again they would use herbs and they would use they would look at the moon and they would know, okay, I've got these mothers and they're probably going to go into labour at this time mm. because the moon's going to be in this position. What are we going to do? Okay, we'll use these remedies, etc. And then suddenly when wealth came in and men took over the power because they were the ones who were educated mm. and there were hospitals, it was seen to be that it wasn't... It was seen to be privilege and and kind of the dumb thing to go to the hospital and not to be with the midwife because mm -hmm. then you were like rich, right? You, yeah. you could a allow to take your wife. So all the rich people wanted to see their wives go to the hospitals, mm. but they didn't have the midwifery knowledge. They had the modern medical knowledge mm -hmm. and it was more complicated and much more things went wrong because mm. it hadn't been tested for so long. And then as that went on and people started to see it as the only way to do things, people got afraid of the old way because it seemed more simple. Yeah. And it's the same thing that's happened now. We have 
have this kind of massive distrust of the simplicity mm -hmm. of the free, essentially free mm -hmm. cures that mm -hmm. are here. We only trust, okay, this costs a lot of money. We're paying the medicine mm -hmm. for the medicine, which has also been tested in these studies, which we paid for mm -hmm. and massively funded by pharma or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But when it's like an onion and a garlic mm -hmm. and a black pepper that we can all have in our house and we can use for free, a, no one can profit from that, mm -hmm. so there's that element yeah. that comes in. But there's B, this feeling of like, well, this is parochial. This mm -hmm. is like old school, back in the day, mm -hmm. I can't possibly trust it as much. I'd rather go to that doctor, pay loads of money mm -hmm. and get this pill that I don't know what's in it, and pay loads of money for that. And then I feel like it's above board and mm -hmm. it's going to help me. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that we've seen this thing mm -hmm. kind of tease out. Like there's a humanity in us that wants to go towards what's more complicated, what costs more money, is just necessarily better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's some, I think, like false narratives thrown around, especially around birth and things like that, like, oh, women used to always die. Yeah. You mm. know, it was so dangerous. You know, they're just, and people fully believe that it was, and like they believe that the, you know, the, in, in, in some of the practices in the hospitals today, like the regular routine practices are not based on anything, any mm. sort of yeah. scientific research yeah. on, you know, but they, and I, I think it's very easy to kind of, um, they like these get these kind of narratives thrown around mm -hmm. that like it, it was so unsafe, it was so dangerous, mm -hmm. it was you know. yeah. I've, I've heard like some person did dug into it said like the reason we had higher death rates was just because we had higher birth rates, but on aggregate, the same amount of people were surviving. Wow, yeah, and which makes so much sense. Yeah, um, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, we just talked about the families, the length, the amount of, yeah. amount of people who aren't having seven kids at yeah. a time, and I think even just the ability to, to be able to, as a, as a mother, without you know any prior knowledge of it just to go through mm -hmm. that many births mm -hmm. it's kind of it's running the gauntlet right mm -hmm. it's like we've spoken to Layla like an amazing mid midwife and um, uh, doula uh, but who sh she was talking about how like that's the bit where you're closest to birth and death and you have the two things happening at the same time mm -hmm. and so of course there's going to be that there's risk, risk. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. but, and but when there's risk we just run to a kind of a, a reassurance which might be a false reassurance yeah. which is interesting isn't yeah it? yeah mm. but I think it's also taking it it's, there is an interesting narrative in there, and it, it's slightly deviating, but I think it, it, it also has a kernel of the same thread, is that it's when it's taken out of the hands of the women and put into the hands of the men because mm -hmm. they were educated and then they were seen to know more. Mm -hmm. and, and there was like a studied knowledge, but that knowledge was, was based on like a short-term base of information, whereas the women had been carrying that lineage tradition orally and passed and down, passed down yeah. for, for generations and generations. And they were traditionally, you know, the witches mm. and the, the healers, the herbal medicine. They were, the doctors were the men, but then mm. the women were the ones that went and did the cures and the medicines and made up the medicines and went around. And you read it historically in texts all the time, all these women who learned the knowledge, but then the families, you can't let the woman has to come in the back door and she brings a herbal remedy and she gives it but you can't tell anyone that you got the remedy from the woman because if it goes wrong the woman's going to be burned at the stake okay, whereas you yeah. can let the doctor in the and front door and if it goes anything. wrong then it's like well you were going to die anyway yeah. it's, and yeah. it's kind of you've seen that same thing happen mm. again and again mm. and again and even the, the coining of the term witchcraft mm. when you're asking like where is that line between witchcraft mm. and herbalism now we see this resurgence where people are trying to reclaim the word witch mm. and they're proudly saying I'm a witch and mm -hmm. this is who I am and yet we're, we're still, we still have this notion of this black hatted woman with a cat who's mm. there flying on a broomstick as opposed to which is just this term that got given in a bad way to women who were using and practicing yeah. and living off the land and using the herbal remedies and there's power associated mm. with that and people didn't like to see power in the hands of women mm -hmm. I think it felt scary to them and so then there was this like burn them at the stake the terrible women you know yeah and that and it's kind of it, it's threading back into this yeah. this same thing isn't it it's like we can't see it we don't have facts about it maybe a lot of it came from women as well in especially in the birthing field yeah. mm -hmm. and we're like ooh, that doesn't seem very safe those yeah. women can't possibly have known they yeah. were uneducated yeah you know? yeah yeah, being uneducated is the thing, isn't it? Life experience isn't taken as much value. And it's, yeah. it's funny because you hear people, a lot of people refer to sending their kids to college knowing that it's the best thing to do. Like they have to, blah, 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 must do that. But also out of the side of the mouth going like, I mean, I know whatever they do won't really be informed by that. They're going there to like be social and da, 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 and, you know, learn how to learn essentially a little bit. But really it's like, you know, the life experience that will lead them wherever they go. So I don't care if they do an arts degree. I don't care if they do a da, 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 da. And it's kind of, it was still this sort of acceptance that we must go through that thing of learning the knowledge in that formal yeah. school thing, that it's not allowed to be just picked up as you go. And I'm a total autodidact. I mean, I've like, everyone asks when I'm in the shop talking to people about 
whatever it is around healing. It's like, where did you study? I'm like, <laughs> this is good life. Like, I mean, I have like tiny little things that I've done certificates, but I don't feel like the most of my knowledge has come from any of the formal study. Like I did a bit of whatever. I did like a, 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 a diploma in, um, uh, what is it called? Nutrition, lifestyle, coaching, whatever. And I don't feel like I learned from that anything that I would bring into practice that would add to you know, the store of information that I can be useful to people with, you know. Um, but now we look to the piece of paper. It's yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. We don't yeah. care what the piece of paper is. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, yeah. the university yeah. thing is, they were like, yeah. we don't mind, they can do a degree in anything. It's just so long as they have the piece of paper, then mm -hmm. they're seen to be learned and yeah. seen to be of a certain yeah. echelon. And that's mm -hmm. the thing is, we're still stuck on this. You had that knowledge. Yeah. You have no more knowledge really now than you did before you did the diploma. But now you've got the diploma, so people are going to go, well, he knows, he knows yeah, to go to him. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah, no, that's exactly it. The best thing I did, so I did like a diploma, I did an apprenticeship, a master's then in pharmacognosy, which was brilliant, but then, and then the PhD. But you the were speaking to somebody who's thing, gone through that, yeah, that's yeah, for but, sure. Like. Uh, so I'm the, I'm, I would be the first with my daughter, I'd be like, you don't have to do any, you know, you just follow your kind of, you know, your knowing, mm. whatever that is. And if you want to, great. Like I wanted to, mm. you know, maybe not for all the like right reasons, I don't know. But the best thing I ever did was a apprenticeship with a herbalist, an Irish herbalist, Nikki Darrell, and or herbalist in Ireland, and she like it was just amazing. We she it was it was very much like we learned about the plants in story form. Mm. It was kind of in a much more traditional way. So it was like we'd gather, and we were gathering in her home, and we would she would talk about the plants. We would get to know the plants. Mm. We like meditated with the plants. It was just like the best learning definitely that mm. I ever got and it's it was it was a you know it wasn't the accredited it wasn't yeah. it wasn't accredited <laughs> yeah. it could be I think because I think if you do more years you could because that's what they do now in herbalisms you know get accredited yeah. but this section that I did wasn't anyway and it was just beautiful mm. you know and she was like um just this woman with so much knowledge and was passing it on mm. and it was yeah and can you talk to us about what are some of the traditional Irish plants or remedies or things that come up that, that are Irish specific so if people who don't know anything about this or aren't mm -hmm. Irish and they're thinking well what what are these Irish herbs what are these traditional yeah. Irish plants so the there's I didn't plant wise I didn't I looked at the plants that were mostly cited so like mm. there was I think it was like 166 plant species that I kind of came across mm. through the whole study and then focused in on the ones that were most cited and there is nothing I suppose like specific to Ireland that wasn't used in other countries mm -hmm. is what I oh, find. Interesting. Um, but they're like, so, like the commonest plants going is so dandelion mm. was like the top cited one okay. and good for so many different things so like it was in Ireland it was known as um, piss the bed. Yeah. Yeah because it's a diuretic so yeah. it's really good for your bladder it's good for your kidneys but it was also used as a respiratory herbs and there was some cool like recipes so you'd boil dandelion leaves in milk and have it fasting for a certain number of days was one of the cures or um dandelion root as well and like that's like it's everywhere <laughs> you look at your garden dandelions yeah. they're just everywhere you yeah. know and but that's globally dandelion is used a lot and it's it's even they were looking into it in Canada in a study um, about as an anti-cancer treatment as well I don't know how far they've got is that no no taxol is from what you know, mistletoe or something is it? but no, it's mistletoe as well but, but taxol is dandelion it's it's in, yeah, yeah it's it is like, there's something in there yeah the name of yes it? Yeah. Traxum, yeah yeah wow so that's and then another one which we all know as well is nettle mm. so like that was a huge one that came up and that would be very much a preventative and they would say because it would kind of get rid of having spring nettle tops like make a soup out of it or a tea the juice of a nettle and then have it like three times on may day and it kind of gets rid of the stagnant you know phlegm from winter mm. and um it was used as a tonic as well and then other plants that would have come up are marshmallow oh, i don't i don't know if that was though i don't think that was actually indigenous to ireland i think that came in oh. elderflower came up not hugely in what i found really? but, it, but okay. it did come up yeah yeah you know some ones that i thought would have had kind of more citations i think yeah. i call them citations of mm. how many times they yeah. were mentioned um but there was things like uh then we had the imported things like uh mustard and oh, interesting pepper and yeah. tea was huge 
Um, tea is a cure for, is it like because of the, of what you call the astringent thing? Yeah, okay, yeah. Ah. So a lot for, for eye things. Oh, so yeah. again, because this was written by kids, a lot of the cures are really kind of simple things, mm. cuts, bruises, mm -mm. and uh, but then and coughs and colds and things like that. Mm. Um, but dandelion was also used for consumption, actually. And um, then there was, so we've got potato was used a lot. And that was an import to Ireland, but it's mm. like we, we own it now. It's yeah. so Irish, but it isn't like it's only new. Well, I know, 16th yeah, yeah. century, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Water Rally, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that was used a lot. So, again, it's kind of like accessibility, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what, how did, what was potato used for? So, it would have been used for a lot of skin conditions. Mm -hmm. So, and for, so external. Yeah. And you would boil, potato water would be used mm. um, for external. Potato water is poisonous, so don't take it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> just in just, case. Just there are a few case. caveats here. Just, We're not giving any prescriptions, no just to be clear. <laughs> but, um, huh. so, yeah, so, so many other plants. Comfrey, huge. And comfrey, yeah. you can't take it internally, mm. you know, legally in Ireland. In Europe, is it? All over uh, I think it's just Ireland for that. It's not, okay. it's not X. I think, I think it's Irish. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was, yeah. it was, it came up quite a bit. It's one of the most cited and it mm. would have been used externally, but internally as well. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, so, but there was nothing, so there probably would be like maybe plants from the bogs, like bog bean and things like that would be oh, quite yeah. specific to Ireland, but I didn't focus in on them. Mm. But my supervisor actually, there's a study, I think it's going on at the minute looking at that because I think probably it's um, mm. more specific. But um, the, the, the translation even, of the fact that you're saying there's a coherence between plant use in different countries is even more like emphatically proof, isn't it? You're yeah, like, wow. so they're found in like caves, in like ancient, you know, like the opposite side of the world, in like ancient, like, whatever, you know, Samaria, whatever, yeah, 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 like the, the you know, dandelion leaves or daisy, Amazing. daisy's another one that came up quite a bit. Oh, wow, interesting, which is also known as a bit of a toxic one as well, isn't it? Daisy. Am I wrong? That? Am I wrong? I no, thought Daisy. Okay, maybe. 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 I don't know. Yeah. No. No. I feel like I know very little, to be honest. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Don't eat daisies. <laughs> <laughs> but so daisies would be external as well, and um, chickweed came up. Yeah. Um, like you name it, there's probably a citation in there for something, if wow. you know what I mean. Yeah. And what, like, so when you drew all this research together and all this information. Obviously, you were frustrated by the lack of information and having to yeah. focus on one major source. Yeah. But what did you come to the conclusion? Like, what, what, what were your conclusions around your PhD? Like, where, where did you end up on, in terms of, I don't know, what, what your ideas were and how they kind of distilled? So, conclusions. That's a good question. Um, you do have to have them, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't no, done any do. of the yeah, academic right. can, I a, can I have a quick read? No. <laughs> We're not letting her near her PhD, PhD manual. <laughs> no, the, the conclusion is, well, with the collection I looked at, yeah. I looked at two counties. Mm -hmm. I it, ended up looking at a bit more, but like the bulk of the study was just focusing on two counties. Mm. And there was just like that over 166 plant species. And um, I think it was like over 68 plant, different plant families named. Like there was so much information. Mm. And that was probably an issue that there was so much information that I think the magic could be in the little nugget. Mm. You know, like the, you know, what's the specific plant that actually does it only grows in Ireland mm. here? Mm. What is that? And what was that used for? And I think if, if, one was, it won't be me, but if one was to go back in and look at the rest of the counties, okay, yeah, um, yeah. I, something might come up and there could even be something in there that I kind of missed. Sure. I mean, like it's a hell of a troll. Because there was just so much information. Mm. Yeah. And um, so one of the conclusions is that there's so much and it's actually, it's so like, it, it's such a, in terms of like Irishness and Irish culture, it's just such a valuable asset we have. Mm. Like no other country in the world has any, well, they have something mm. like this. Estonia has really good archives as well. And um, some Northern European countries, but there's, it's so, it's utterly unique. Oh really? Yeah. That's cool. And it's even accessible now online on a website called dukas.ie. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. you can actually go and look at the you original can go and look text. I can see that, yeah, they've transcribed it all and, or yeah. digitized it all. Okay. And except for small copy books, there's, you know, a, a section that hasn't, but also it's open to the public can go in mm. into the, um, the National Folklore Collection yeah. at certain times and kind of access the material. So mm. if you've any family that's like from 
whatever part of the country you can actually just cool. google to see because you could were find they out, yeah were they were, you know do they participate because not all of them but some of the segments are signed by the you know have the name of the child that brought the information that's oh that's so cool what is, what's also amazing about it is the inclusion of children in that yeah it is such an amazing thing because i think what we're seeing especially in our work is you know that like we we're saying people are coming around people want us to talk on mm. ritual they want us to tell them about healing from your own home store cupboard yeah. everyone wants to come back to these knowledge and i think there's a yearning and i think people haven't maybe even thought through why do i have this yearning yeah. to connect back into nature and back into the cycles and back into these simple remedies but there is definitely a collective yearning mm -hmm. and a movement towards that even the fact that our friend courtney's foraging courses i mean they just sell out in a wow. second everyone wants to go to them they want to know yeah what does this do how can i pick it people are so excited it's about it it's so empowering mm -hmm. and it's so again there's that connection back historically feeling like we're off the land that we're mm. rooted somewhere that we're not untethered and i think with social media and all these things we do have the sense of an untethering mm. where we're mm. not connected mm -hmm. and where we're craving groundedness and, mm -hmm. and knowing about the roots and plants is a thing but i think when we then take it one stage further and in include the children in that it's even further grounding because we're moving into that next generation but they're growing up with that just an innate knowledge of like running barefoot, knowing mm. that they can, like I see it in my son, he knows he can pick the gorse flowers and he's like, oh look, I can eat these gorse flowers or look at this thing that I can do with this. Or, mm. And he feels empowered by that thing mm. and he feels excited to tell me and then to not be scared, we don't get overwhelmed by coughs and colds and bumps and all these things because mm. we know, well should you just go pick that thing and then you rub it on there and it just makes everything feel more integrated and more natural, mm -hmm. right? Rather than, it's weird, it's like we see it as mystical now, but it's actually demystifying these yeah. things that are scary to us yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's like, you know, it's like they say, oh, evolution, but like we've kind of just devolved. Yeah. In like most yeah. respects, I think. Do you yeah. know, like yeah. maybe like, you know, uh, digitally wise, yeah, but like with a lot of other things, we've just completely gone away from all this knowledge that we had, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a, I remember going to a, an art uh, exhibition in Galway a few years ago and inside this big shed was this huge photograph of like a lump of, I don't know, turf in a bog essentially, kind of rounded lump of turf. And it was like, I was just got chatting to the person who was whatever they're invigilating and or curating whatever they're doing. And, um, and I asked them, what's that? And they were like, oh, that's a sauna. I was like, it's a what? They're like, it's a sauna. It's a big art. It's a big art tradition of sauna. And like so many of these practices that we see as being like, you know, like we'll use turmeric from India because we'll trust that. Yeah. We'll use like yeah. sauna because it's a Finnish tradition. And we're like, well, we bow and scrape to that thing. But with so much of it is actually here already. And again, you're talking about that empowering thing. It's so empowering to know that like a lot of that knowledge is, is of this land and it's of our mm -hmm. people. And there's so much that we can, you know, extract from our own awareness, even magic mushrooms, because apparently the story that goes with that sauna thing is that, a, a traveling mystic uh, shaman of some sort I don't know what the word is that they would have put on them on that day and I think shaman probably takes it into the wrong cultural reference but that they would have come to an area uh, once they say one, like at a certain time of year they would have temporarily the whole community would have temporarily built a sauna a sauna out of turf and then they would have uh, had all sorts of like smoke ritual things inside they would have taken magic mushrooms as well there's been like yeah. parts remnants of magic mushrooms found around these things wow. and then they're temporary so cattle knock them down within a couple of months and so nothing really remains apart from these very few on um, I think that was from a headland in Sligo or something like that where yeah. it happened to be preserved because of the nature of where it was built but so much of those that like what you're saying it's so powerful to have uh, something that grounds us in uh, like a sense of like okay wisdom without knowledge it's like that kind of intuitive mm. wisdom thing it's like you don't have to it's, it's like they, like they always talk about kids when they get to like age five or six oh there was something I was reading the other day where it was a, a dad who was asking his kid like where did you come from where did you come from and the kid was like oh I'll tell you I'll tell you one day and then he asked him once when he was five or six and he hadn't asked him and he just said oh I've forgotten and it's like it's that oh, wow. it's it's oh, mad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's it's such a powerful kind of poignant yeah. kind of note that you're kind of you have this sense that we're kind of it's just a, a forgetting and that yeah. relearning and such a such yeah. a great bit of research that you've done and it's great that we can like start to spread the word around that and that it's like digitized and it's there for people to see and to yeah. take on and like I'd like to know like what has it influenced what your practice is going to be going forward like totally yeah. without a doubt so I would have like. First of all, learning about herbs, wanted to learn about them because I thought Ayurveda was amazing and, you know, I was so curious by that and like all the sexy herbs, the, you yeah. know, the ashwagandha, like all of these big hitters, they do all this, this and this. Mm. And then like what I've kind of 
come like still great and still like amazing but i'm like it's it's all there in front of us mm. it's on our it's literally it's in our like little green space that grows there whatever's coming up is for you cleavers like dandelion like all these so that's what kind of excites me now mm. so i think it very much i would um it, you know it's it's changed that view for mm. me of like the value of like and i i truly think as well that like what grows around us is force and is more suited for mm. us for our bodies for everything because mm. it's it's more than just a compound yeah. you know it's the whole thing it's the yeah. whole energy of a plant it's the you know and that energy of a plant that's kind of linked to the ritual thing as well like it's it's more than just a compound yeah yeah, yeah. and that's naturally linked into the cycles and the seasons yes, yes. as well exactly. yeah. so you can't help but live seasonally if yeah. you're using the plants that yeah. are growing in your garden yeah because exactly. they won't be there they outside be of their own season yeah yeah, yeah. and isn't there also a thing about I was listening to you talk there and thinking about it's so true that thing of like linking in but also it's about like faith right because mm. there's a, an, an element of just not blind faith but a faith that we've lost in kind of general life mm. where we don't have this we, we have to see evidence we have to see fact-based yeah. things and we've kind of lost that I think loads of people feel like they don't have faith in human nature they don't have faith in humanity they don't have faith in all these and there's kind of you know there's a lot of mental health stuff going around and mm -hmm. depression and things where people feel like they've lost faith and I think we literally have as a society lost faith mm -hmm. because back in the day we had these things and you'd be told them by your mother or your grandmother and mm -hmm. you just have faith mm -hmm. that what they were telling you was the truth and you weren't asking them well how do you know because like, how yeah. many studies have you seen done on them yeah. Yeah. it was like I believe it. Yeah. yeah. And I think we need that as a humans. We need people. that trust, that innate faith mm -hmm. and trust in ourselves and in our culture and in people and just people mm -hmm. in general that we don't yeah. need. Not that we don't need science. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's there and it's got these uses, but we are also the experiment. Like mm -hmm. we have the years of experience. We're the proof of mm -hmm. the years of those experiments bearing fruit ourselves. Yeah. 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 Humanity has been so kind of transient as well for the last, whatever, a couple of hundred years since we were able to travel a lot. That communities are really only finding themselves maybe again maybe even during lockdown as a result of the lack of travel that there's a little bit more settling and a bit more getting to know each other and it's not like that neighbor who stays in that flat for a year and moves on and maybe that's out of born out of a necessity that that isn't pleasant but it's an interesting thing like i remember somebody telling me years ago which i love that your soul travels at the pace of a camel so that if you like you know if we're constantly moving and if society if you think about it generally there's so much kind of dislocation and movement mm -hmm. in society that it's maybe only when societies begin to settle into a place and begin to like open their eyes to each other and the kind of their natural world around they start to be able to explore that like mm -hmm. like you can't it's like you know when you see one ant like you're looking at the ground so he goes look all the ants and you go like i can't see any ants and then say look there's one and you go oh there's one ant and then you go, oh no, and, and then you suddenly see the ground is actually covered in ants and your feet are too. Yeah. You know, it's like that you need a little bit of time to settle in before you can kind of explore that kind of intuitive space around herbs, particularly mm -hmm. like with Nikki Durrell. Nikki Durrell? Nikki Darrell. Nikki Darrell. Yeah. yeah, like her type of practice is so intuitive that it's like, you, it's like people want to get that piece of paper and do it all in three years or four years. And they want the beginning, middle and end. Once I have the paper, I can practice. But Nikki Darrell's practice for me feels like something, like you can't, rush it yeah. you can't say i'm going to get this done in four years it'll like come to you when it comes to you and you're going to have to sit down and wait yeah. essentially mm -hmm. which i really love about the practice with herbs yeah. so that's something that like you know you can't uh, i like there's so much around um the work that i mean that, that i do in the shop where it's like constantly thirsting for knowledge and thirsting information but it's like once every three or four years where i have like a i don't know like i'm reading something that connects back to something from years ago and i go ah. Oh, you know, and it and it suddenly starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. But you're you're consuming all this knowledge that means nothing in between. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. it's like a strong tendency. And it's um, the wisdom to be able to see the important bits hmm. within all the roots and the yeah. you know because you need to have that experience of constantly trying, constantly learning, constantly be exposed to be able to see the gem. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, maybe there's a gem there that you missed because yeah. you were so like I have to do it in do this period of time. Yeah. I've got to focus, focus on this yeah. thing. And when we have the time you know, like lockdown, to sit in our gardens and be slow and mm. simplify. You know, it might not be the first day, it might be month seven that you suddenly go, oh, what's that in that corner of the garden that yeah. I didn't notice there, you know? Yeah. And knowledge is that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Totally. Well, thank you very much for that. That was an thank amazing you. chat. That's a great note to sign off. And, and like, yeah, I think if um, if there's anything I can bring from this, it's it, like, it, it, it feels like it's going to help me slow down. And I nearly made a tea before we came on with comfrey and sage and nettle and stuff from the garden and it's something that i i started like weeding and not just treating the weeds as weeds and i think that's the thing isn't it yeah like and, and largely the herbs are the weeds yeah um, yeah 
and it's what you get lost amongst those weeds that you'll find all those, like you say, the gems. Mm. Um, so thank you very much yeah, for, for helping you. us expose all that oh, and yeah, explore it. It was thanks great. For me. Um, so thank you guys for watching as well, or listening, or wherever you are. Um, please don't forget to uh, like, subscribe, post comments, come and find us on Instagram at Wandering Into Wellness and tell us what else you'd like us to explore chats wise because this is the sort of area that makes us giddy uh, around natural health but we would always want to be responding to what you want us to talk about uh, and, and also if you have yes well, just yeah. for this particular episode if you have any family remedies that have been passed oh, yeah. down oh. or any stories about seventh sons or what charming or any of these kinds of things please send them in because it would be so nice for us to collate them and put them up on our um on our little instagram and show people so people can tune in and read and we can add to them because that would be another lovely way of connecting mm. absolutely exactly to start that again because that yeah. should be really a continuous mm. practice shouldn't, shouldn't it? It? maybe you. that's your we'll next thing yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay anyway thanks so much for watching uh, don't forget uh, to look up our sponsors Clearlight um, amazing saunas infrared saunas we just had I just showed Fiona uh, my lovely unit in the back garden uh, where I get to do all of that amazing bathing in infrared light which is the thing that we don't get enough of when we're exposed to these awful ring lights uh, all day long <laughs> um, so yeah uh, that's about it um, we'll chat to you soon see you in the next one Bye. Bye. Bye.